So what I'm trying to do is um, I'm trying to cover the matter from the previous assignment that has sort of the right level of detail that I'm looking for. And I'll check if that group is okay to post that example online for the rest of you to see. Uh, then there was another question via the course uh, feedback website if, um, or regarding book value calculations. So I unfortunately won't have time in today's class to go book value calculations, but I um, may pick it up. Or what I plan to do is just post an example on the course website that's worked on the appreciation of book value is fine at the time. One thing that I do want to emphasize at this particular point in the course is May is our uh, last class on process economics and cash flows. We're going to look at sensitivity analysis. From next week, uh, from tomorrow on, we're going to look at capital cost estimation. If you are not up to speed with this material so far, if you're not feeling confident, you must look for help from TAs and myself. This material does not come back up in the course later on for you to revise. The next time you see it will be in the midterm, then you'll need it for your project and then you'll need it for the final exam. Uh, so it's not the standard course that builds up the material and you're not going to see this, this quite the content again. To put it in perspective, what we've covered up to now is pretty much three quarters of this textbook. So this is one of the standard economic textbooks I recommend on the website. The chapters we've skipped over are things like NPDs and cash flows when it comes to working for government projects. So the government decides to build a bridge, there's a huge capital outflow, and they never get money back in again. So how do we evaluate those types of government public works projects? And there's a few other specialized topics in here on annuities and a few other things we don't cover. So we've covered a lot of material. Um, please make sure that you are up to with all the terminology and appreciation, book value, cash flows, NPDs, NARR, DCFRRs, all these new terms that are not chemical engineering uh, related, but we are required to understand for this course. So today's class, we're, we're picking up on the last topic here on the comparison of alternatives, and this is slide 104. We're going to look at, when we've made our cash flow sheet so far, we've assumed 100% certainty of all our values. We're confident in what these values will be for the future. I've started in the last tutorial to introduce the topic of inflation, where we're saying, well, we know that we're not going to keep our prices the same in the, in the subsequent years when we go through the market. Our raw material costs are going to increase with time. But we've used a fixed percentage to, to handle it. What we're looking at in today's class is a little different. We're saying, what if we don't make our sales targets that we planned for? What if we decided we're going to get sales that are worth 5,000 and instead we land up with 2,000? What is the effect on NPD? What is the effect on ECFRR? Um, what if we miscalculate our energy costs? So here's an example. If energy prices increase at a greater rate than what we may have anticipated, what if, how is that going to affect our NPV? Can we make a decision um, on whether we should go ahead with this project or not based on certain energy usage scenarios? So we could look at the worst case and best case usage scenarios and then, and then make our decision a little bit more informed based on this risk that we're going to uh, anticipate. What if the lifetime of the project isn't the, the any number of periods is longer or shorter? Um, and other costs and tax rates that may change. All this comes down to dealing with what we call sensitivity analysis. So we're going to take a very brief look at what sensitivity analysis is. This is something that you should be having in your project report for the SDL. So now that you've chosen your SDL topics, um, start to think what might be the parameters that affect the processing unit that, that you pick, that your group has picked. What are going to be the uncertainties in those, um, in those units? So we are focused obviously on the parameters that have the greatest level of uncertainty. Certain things are not going to vary by much. For example, the percentage depreciation. If the government of Canada says it's 30%, you can be pretty sure that they're not going to radically change that 30% to 50% or 20% or some other number in future years. Those depreciation constants stay pretty much the same. Tax rate, the company's corporate tax rate is not likely to fluctuate too much. 
uh, maybe a couple of percent either way, but overall, um, you can be pretty much guaranteed the government of Canada is, is going to keep the tax rate and corporation pretty constant. So there's a few things that we don't really investigate in sensitivity analysis, but we do take the factors into account that have the greatest level of uncertainty. So if you just think back to examples we've looked at so far, what might those parameters be? Which would be the ones that you would want to investigate as being the most um, uncertain and what the effect will be on NPV? The inflation percentage? So, yeah, we're asking which factors are going to affect those factors. What uncertainty will impact the cash flow? Specifically, the, T, the, so the, the percentage discount rate that we're using. Okay, so I would <coughs> consider that. That's a, it could be considered an uncertainty, but companies generally choose a value that works for their, their sector and they stick with that value. So it's not too uncertain. It may be changed by a few percentage points either way. But I, I wouldn't consider that an uncertainty in this case. Are you like default uncertainty of the person you're lending the money to? So the person you're lending, so you're, uh, okay, so you're looking at the perspective from, you're, about the, you're the guy with the money and you're lending it to, to someone else. We're looking at the, at the case where the company is choosing where to invest their own money. So I guess in, in the situation you described, what is, it's almost like a catastrophic failure of the project in, in that sense. So I would say there, you're guaranteed to have a, a bad outcome. If the, if the project flops, it flops. So what, what we're looking at is what parameters might cause the project not to be profitable. So we're not looking at catastrophic failure, we're assuming that the engineers have identified the factors that will make the project work or not work. But uh, what do you want to clarify? Oh, sorry, like maybe there's a lawsuit against you, for example. Okay, so un unanticipated lawsuits. So they cash flow out in some future period of time. Uh, do you have another one? Uh, I was going to say that, but uh, there's also this like, market growth, like if, uh, mm -hmm. if you're like, comparing GDP growth or index growth. Okay, so this is being optimistic. What if the market grows bigger than what we had anticipated? How that's also interesting for us um, is if, if things get far better than we we expected, how, how much better are they going to be on our project? So our availability. I would, I would put that as, a, as a inflation of the cost of the raw material becomes less available, it implies higher demand, less supply, the price of that raw material is going to go up. Unforeseen expenses like maintenance costs? Unforeseen maintenance? Lawsuits and this unforeseen maintenance, these are sort of discrete events that take place. So either it happens or it doesn't. So these are scenarios that you could evaluate. What does our NPV look like if we don't have the lawsuit versus if we do have the lawsuit? What if we have a large maintenance uh, cost or not? Or you could be a bit more gradual here, you could see unforeseen maintenance, or you could just see maintenance. This one is, is a major overhaul. This is like the transmission on your car braking. You don't, no one anticipates those things, but this maintenance costs are, are uh, higher. Uh, this is the cost of doing the maintenance, the regular maintenance that you would have done, you know, goes, uh, goes up. So what we'll do in, in these scenarios is we'll identify personal parameters we wish to investigate in the way that we've just brainstormed here a few ideas, and then we'll, we'll look at the range over which those parameters change. We'll choose a lower bound and an upper bound, and we'll vary those parameters through that range. And as we move that parameter, it's going to affect the NPV, and it's going to affect the BCFRR. These are the two metrics we're, we're most concerned about. So, 
So as we evaluate the profitability here, let's note that for all of these, we're going to evaluate the effect on NPV. I'll just emphasize that that's a dollar value that we're going to look at. And the BCFRR. So we're comfortable now with what a good NPV and a bad NPV looks like. So we, we want our NPVs to be at least be positive or certainly greater than, much greater than zero, preferably. And our DCFRRs, we want numbers for DCFRR that if at least meet or exceed our company's minimal acceptable rate of return. So we're going to move these variables through the range of variation that we anticipate. And for all those, we're going to evaluate the effect on NPV and the effect on DCFRR. And what we're aiming for is to see if over the range of variation, our NPV changes and becomes negative, that's going to be worrisome. So if our raw material costs get so, so high, that over the range that we anticipate, let's say for example our raw material costs are between 100 at the lower bound and we maybe anticipate they go up to $200 per kilogram. If our NPV goes from positive to negative as our raw material costs go up, we're going to say, well hang on, there's a, there's a risk here that for high raw material costs this project is not going to break even anymore. So NPV being greater than zero, that's our break even point. Uh, we want to be sure that a project can break even over our anticipated range of variation. And if our conclusions change here, we may decide not to go ahead with the project or select only a project that gives us the higher profit, given the probability of this, uh, of this, of this uh, risk. So coming back to the raw material example, we can say, well, the probability that the raw materials get to $200 a kilogram is, is very minimal, so we're willing to accept that risk as we go ahead. Or if the probability of that event happening is quite high, uh, we may then decide that this project should be shelved and we look at alternative ways to spend our money. So, so that's where we're off then. And with all of this comes good visualization. How can we convey the results to, to um, our managers or to other colleagues? So here's the way that it's most often presented. Let's take a look at the effect in this example of sales price. So this is just one example of the parameter. Sales price here is going from some low value on the x-axis to some high value. And for each point along this blue line, we evaluate the NPV. So for sales price of our final product, let's say this corresponds to $50 per kilogram, we have a negative NPV. We're not making any money on this project. Then if we raise the price of our product to say $100 per kilogram, we find our NPV is exactly zero, and we can keep going up. Uh, let's say this is 100 kilograms over here on this point on the x-axis then that particular point, that sales price, we're making, we're making money. So sales prices then that at least exceed $50 per kilogram or higher, um, it will make us some profit. And here we can say, well, we anticipate the, the market value that we can sell this product for, the sales price to be $100, $100 per kilo. So, so this is okay. So we're happy with this. It's very unlikely that our, we're ever going to be forced into a position where we have to sell our product for, for $50 a kilogram. So this gap between the break-even point at $50 a kilogram and $100 a kilogram is pretty substantial. We don't anticipate ever having to sell our product for too much less than $100 per kilo. So we're, we're happy with this scenario. That sales price has an effect on NPV but the range over where we're going to operate, so in this region, is pretty comfortable. We're comfortable accepting um, some, some slack in our product. It implies that we have some room to move. If our customer is asking us for a break on the price, they want a discount, we're, we could probably give them a discount without substantially changing our profitability. 
uh, because we've got room to move here around that hundred dollar figure. But if we took the situation where let's revise the numbers on that x-axis, let's assume that this break-even point here is fifty dollars a kilo, and that point over there is fifty-five, and that's the current market price, the most likely value for this product right now. That five dollar differential is not a great room to move around. It. So we'll be less less comfortable with this as a as a as a, as a project to go ahead with. Okay, so we're we're interested in that where that line crosses the x-axis, but we're also interested in to where in where we are now and where that point is. So that difference, that distance along the x-axis is also crucial. So that's that's relatively um, relatively straightforward, right? There's nothing there that's too much. Um, but what? Let's take a look at one other case, just to emphasize here is if we took a parameter here, we're looking at sales price. Would would the slope of that line be if our x-axis now changed to the raw material price? What would that blue line? Look if the x-axis got changed to the raw materials price. Right, so as the raw material price increases, our project will become less and less profitable. Okay, so for a parameter that brings us money in, so a parameter like sales price, which is an income, a cash inflow, as we move over to the, to the right-hand side, the NPVs must go up. For parameters that are uh, outflows, such as raw material price, tax rate, salaries, any of those sorts of expenses, the, that, that line goes in the downward direction as, it, as, um, as the price of that cost goes up. So as that cost increases, the NPV must go down. And then for a parameter that doesn't really affect the the NPV too much, so um, a parameter, for example, like percentage depreciation, over the range over which we anticipated, it may not affect NPV too much there. The slope will still decline, but it won't, the, the, the angle of the slope then is going to be much less. So for parameters that have very little sensitivity on NPV, we, um, we don't expect a large slope. So I just want to jump ahead a few slides here to this is an example, it's not in your notes, but it's something uh, that uh, you can just take a look at here visually, it's not for us to, uh, to copy down. This is an example from Dr. Adams' paper that he wrote a few years ago, where he was looking at a multiple number of flow sheet options for generating electricity. So each one of these lines is, is a line representing a different flow sheet configuration. And they were looking at the NPV based on this parameter here, which is electricity produced as a percentage of total output. And this is where the company that's producing this electricity can sell it at seven cents per kilowatt hour. So it's looking at the profitability of the projects over those ranges of electricity produced. And so it's clear here that there's a break-even point for different projects at, at that parameter on the x-axis that's being varied. If electricity is now sold at 10 cents per kilowatt hour instead, all of the projects become profitable, no matter what the range. So here the company is looking at two scenarios. What if electricity is sold? If we can only get seven cents per kilowatt hour for it, then certain of our configurations are not profitable anymore if we're operating this particular part of the, of the process at that percentage. Or if electricity is at a much higher price, we can, we can choose any flow sheet configuration. And then here's a flow sheet configuration, coal only. Notice how the line is pretty much horizontal, indicating that for all the percentages, the NPV or our break even is relatively insensitive to that particular choice of the, of the flow sheet. Okay, so this is how these pro, uh, plots are, are, are shown and interpreted. Um, here's, a, here's another one for NPVs. Again, changing NPV is a whole region of configurations which have no, no, no uh, benefit. Really. So, from a company's perspective, uh, all those configurations of the flow sheet are not profitable, no matter where we operate, which percentage 
we operate. Whereas all these are complex. So this is a standard way of representing the data. So, so companies are very much interested in, in these, these MPV sensitivity costs because at the end of the day, they're going to want to know what, under which conditions are we going to lose money. Right, that's all that matters to the finance people is under which conditions are we going to lose money. So there, we often see plots that look, a, look along these lines over here. Let's take a look. If a company is producing a product on a new, on a new flow sheet, they can choose at which particular throughput they're operating. Are we operating at a low production rate or a high production rate? So we move along that x-axis. There's certain costs on this flow sheet uh, that, are, that are always there. Fixed costs. So what do we mean by fixed costs? What are, what are, what are fixed costs for a company? Like their cost of the equipment? Cost of the equipment? Labor. Labor does labor change with the percentage production if we're uh, it's it's a, it's not a, it's not straightforward. Yeah, we'll talk about labor in a minute. Yeah. Property tax. Property taxes. Rent. Yes, I would say rent, but electricity. Will that change with production rates? If I'm producing 100 kilos per hour versus 500 kilos per hour, right, so so electricity is not a fixed cost, but rent is. Anything else? Insurance, the company's insurance um, would be another fixed cost. These are costs, no matter if they're producing at zero kilos per hour or 500 or 1,000 kilograms per hour on this axis, they always have to pay those costs. Then the variable costs obviously are those that, that change in proportion to the production rate, so electricity and utilities. Labor is, a, is one of those that kind of does. Um, it, labor tends to be more along the lines of um, that as you go through higher production rate, you can usually uh, go to a higher production rate and have one person do the job until they just complain that this, they're overloaded, then you have to hire a second person to increase the production rate a third and fourth. So it's a bit more of a stepwise type type movement. But yeah. Yeah, sure. Did you have a question from last time? You were saying that labor is an expense, but what about uh, bonuses? Are they also expense? Yeah. Yeah, bonus would be expensed. It's, it would cost the company money to pay those bonuses. It's, it's just a, it's part of salaries. Right? So, it's, so, so variable costs then are all those things that, that uh, change in proportion to the production rate. And, and many of our customers do that as well. So if I add my fixed costs with my variable costs, then I get this green line. So that green line represents the sum of, of the, the costs that I have in my process. And then my revenue is given here by the pink line. If I'm producing no product, I make no money. As I produce a certain amount of product, I can, assuming the key assumption with this plot is I'm selling everything I'm producing. Right? That's not always true. So assuming our revenue is <coughs> due to us being able to sell all the product that we've produced, uh, that generally goes up linearly. Where we get to the point where our revenue exceeds our fixed plus variable costs. So here at this point where they're equal is our break even point. And then any point beyond this, this is our region of being profitable. So we're very, very interested in, in this sort of plot. The key thing here when you're showing the data in this way, the dollar figures must be NPV dollars. So this is not just the dollars within one year. This is the NPV dollars. So as I change my production rate from zero, over the entire lifetime of the plant, so if your N years is 15 years, you evaluate the cash flows of operating at, at a given production rate for all the, the life of the plant. Calculate those dollar figures, discount them for today's money, and bring them to NPV dollars using the current MARR for your company. So for your, your sector, you'll have a 10%, 15% MARR. Whatever the case is, use that to deflate and calculate your NPV. And that's what's going on this y-axis over here. These are NPV dollars. Okay, so this plot is, is, is NPV dollars versus production rate. 
and this is what, what, uh, what we want to see from a financial point of view, is where is this NPV rate even? And as long as we're operating over to that side, at those production rates, we're going to be comfortable. Many times when we start up a process, we're not able to achieve our full production rate. So it, it gives us a good idea of where we should be operating and beyond in order to keep our process possible. Now, there are cases where that uh, curve, the, the fixed costs, are not linear. So here, here we see one sort of example of that is, is a stepwise function based on, on uh, salaries. The salaries uh, would uh, go up as, as production rate, sorry, as production rate. There's a salary. But then, which other, why, why might you have situations where your fixed, sorry, where your variable costs do not scale linearly? What, 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 might, what might cause that your costs to go up much, much faster than, than the linear rate? <coughs> you're paying overtime for people, so then you're paying them a higher wage per hour. Good point. So you're, you're, you're producing at a higher rate than you normally would. You now have to hire extra labor, extra um, time, pay, or pay your current employees overtime, so you, you're, you're scaling up. Yeah. Okay, so we're looking at one point in time and say what, what's going to change if, if we increase our production rate say from 50% to 70%. And then from 70 to 80 and 80 to 90, we're going to see this almost exponential climb. What, what conditions might cause that? You're working your equipment harder, so it might be more maintenance and repair costs. Greater maintenance, repair costs, yeah. Um, maybe there's a point where you have to rent out that second room for the warehouse. Right, you're producing so much product now, you have to rent a, a whole second warehouse. That single warehouse is not big enough anymore. Great. You, yeah, exceed the capacity of the equipment, you may have to bring another unit in to, to handle that extra capacity. Right, diminishing returns as you start pushing the processes to the maximum. Um, the other thing is that bear in mind that companies often pay uh, for the electricity on a contract. So as long as they stay between certain lower and upper, lower and upper bounds, they get a certain cents per kilowatt hour uh, contract from their from their supplier of electricity. As you're going through higher throughput, you may just breach that upper bound, and then now have to start to pay really high penalties for for using a greater amount of energy. So. So, so those those factors would vary. Uh, same, you may have you may have uh, contracts with your raw materials. And then that, that as long as you're using a certain rate, you, you get your raw materials, and then now you, you give them demand for new raw materials at short notice, and you have to pay a premium for to, to meet that uh, requirement. Your transportation network may not uh, may, may need capacity. You may have uh, been using truck, and now you have to use truck and railway in order to start ship your product, or truck, rail, and and airplane. Storage was the one example that was mentioned, and keeping your inventory. So, so a lot of these costs don't scale linearly with production rate, um, and so you can actually get into a counterintuitive case where. As you go through higher production rate, yes, you're earning more dollars coming in, but you can actually not break even anymore. You, you now you break even, uh, you break even over here, and you break even at a second position, and so this is your region of profitability. Uh, so that seems a bit counterintuitive, but it, it, it can happen. Okay, so, so we have to bear that, bear that in mind when we're looking at some of these scenarios. Here's another slide that's not in your notes. I just wanted to point out how these visualizations for sensitivity analysis could be looked at. Uh, this is an alternative representation that we sometimes see. Let's just take a look at here at what's going on. We're plotting the NPV on our y-axis. And for our base case, so our base case estimates of sales, our base case estimate of costs, and, uh, and the other parameters in our, in our cash flows. 
we compute the NPV at the company's given MARR. So for a given MARR, at the base case conditions of our raw materials, our capital costs, our expected sales, all of those we have some base case condition around which we're building our, our cash flow. And we calculate a certain NPV given here by this horizontal blue line at that MARR. Then we can say, well, what if we vary sales and increase it by 10%, increase sales by 20%? And so we get this green line developing. Or just an increase in sales, keeping all other costs fixed. So we're able to get a higher dollar value um, for our price than we anticipated. So if the market demand grows beyond what we expected, we're doing better and better. Our NPV goes up relative to our base case is the one. And then conversely, if we're unable to meet the, the sales price that we were hoping for, our NPV goes drop. Capital costs can have fairly dramatic change on the NPV. If our capital costs go up even by 10%, uh, we're starting to we still get a just positive NPV, but then as they go beyond 10% and get up to 20%, our NPVs quickly go below zero. So here's zero NPV on this part. This is where we, where we break even. So capital costs can have an extremely strong negative slope down, indicating that for very minor changes in our capital cost estimates, we're not going to be profitable. This would be an undesirable project, because capital costs are something we're very poor at estimating. You'll we'll start to see that from the next class on, we have a very high degree of uncertainty in our capital cost estimates. So if we were evaluating a project where at even 10% to 20% uncertainty we started to go negative, this would be incredibly undesirable because the level of error in our capital cost estimates are over 30% in many cases. We cannot estimate capital costs well at all. And we'll see a few examples of that tomorrow. So for a project where we see something as steep as that for capital costs, that may be an undesirable situation. Conversely, if we had the situation where our raw materials here seem to have very little effect on NPV. Sure, as our raw materials drop in price, we are able to get a higher NPV, but we, it's not too much of a difference compared to some of the other slopes on that. Okay, so this is an attractive way to visualize multiple changes on one plot. Whereas this previous plot over here, um, we're looking at one parameter at a time. Here we can look at multiple parameters on the plot and look at them but from a percentage change basis. And then a final way we can look at two parameters at a time is to simply show NPV against parameter one. So for example, T1 could be sales. So as sales increase for a given line, of P2, so here's P2 at a certain fixed price. So at a given value of P2, as sales go up, my NPV gets better and better. So P1 is sales, and P2 might be raw material costs. So as my raw material costs go up, so this is low raw material costs, and low raw material costs, and high raw material costs, uh, I can see the effect of both those parameters at the same time on NPV. So is that, that, that should be, that plot should be clear. It's hard to visualize these days. So we've looked at three, three different ways of it to visualize this sort of information. Here's one example where we're simply plotting NPV against one parameter at a time um, for, for different fixed, uh, for, for production rates in this example. The second example would be to look at just simply percentage change of a variable or variables. And then the third one is to look at two parameters at a time where you fix one parameter on your x-axis and then you draw a variety of lines uh, for P2 under different scenarios of P2. Okay, so this is, uh, yeah, I'll just show a quick example in the, in the notes. Uh, this was that example from slide 80, the spreadsheet that we, uh, that we went through in the last class. For a $5,000 cost in year zero, $5,000 cost in year two, uh, depreciation. So I just put it up here in a spreadsheet and, and, and put it up 
there. But then here I've done a, a source sensitivity analysis. So I'm looking here at the effect on NPV as I change my revenue. So if my revenue is now 1,000 per year instead of the base case is 3,000. So my base case NPV was 3,000 uh, revenue per year and it corresponds to an NPV of 3,160. But let's say my anticipated revenues are one third of that. I'm, I've got a negative NPV, so I'm not very and as I increase that revenue, NPV goes up, and it is exact in exact straight line. So there's a certain revenue price of just over two thousand dollars. As long as I'm beyond that, and here's my base case of three thousand. If I'm comfortable with that room between three thousand and two thousand two hundred, that room of eight hundred dollars. If that's something I'm comfortable with, then I, I would go ahead with this project. You can also plot the DCFRR as a function of changing revenues. You have just changed revenue, keeping all other variables fixed. And for low revenues, this project has a negative DCFRR. As revenues go up, DCFRR goes up. So it's, it's the same idea um, as, as that. And then the only difference is that here we, we often get non-linear curves. For, for the same amount of change on the x-axis, we can get some non-linear change it's, it's, it's minor nonlinearity. The key point here is I've shown my blue line, this horizontal blue line at 10%. That's my company's minimal acceptable rate of return. My MARR, the company's requirement is as long as we're making 10% or greater on these projects, we're comfortable. So not, not too much different information here, in fact. Um, this blue line crosses here at about the same, same value, indicating we're going to make a profit for any sales price that goes beyond uh, 2,000, where our CFRR exceeds our MARR. So that's 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 expensive. So that's the that's the parameter revenue. If I go change expenses up here, so here my expenses instead of being uh, 500 every year, I can change them to different numbers, so 1,000, and then I go to that spreadsheet updates and it recomputes the NPV down here. So I can simply do that a couple of times and plot the effect of NPV as a change of expenses. And so here we see NPV on my vertical axis. I haven't labeled it, but this is NPV over here. No matter what my expenses are, whether they're at a very low value of 300, or even as great as 1,000, so my base case was 500, even if my expenses double, as long as my sales increase, I'm still making an NPV that exceeds zero. Okay, so so this, is, this is giving me comfort here that at least in terms of that uncertainty in expenses, I can handle the doubling in my expenses and I would still be uh, making a profit on this project. DCFRR, again, for all values of expenses, Here's my company's MARR of 10%. So this is the very minimum return I expect from the project. For all the variability in expenses, I'm exceeding that 10%. So I'm, I'm very comfortable in handling that uncertainty in my expenses. Okay, so these are, uh, once you have your cash flow spreadsheet set up, and especially when you've left your, uh, these figures in the cash flow as variables up here to manipulate, it's quite easy to go um, generate those plots. A little bit tedious, you just go change them one at a time, but it, it's, it's, it's doable. Right? So, so getting those, those visualizations up is not an issue. Okay, then just the final uh, bit here on sensitivity analysis and how to, how to do it. We're, we've looked at so far is just changing our variables one at a time, right? So for those of you that have taken my statistics course, you know that you should never be changing variables one at a time. We've looked at the effect of sales keeping everything else constant. So what is the effect of increasing the sales price if I hold all my raw materials constant, if all my labor costs constant? What is the effect of changing my raw materials price keeping sales constant? Some of the, those, those combinations don't ever happen. So there's, there's often interaction between the variables. So what we tend to do is, 
we, we generate scenarios. So if I have two uncertain variables, so there's variable x1 that's uncertain, and variable x2 that's uncertain, what we can go do is we can construct a, a, a point where this is the base case of x1, this is the base case of x2. So this is the most likely parameter value for x1 and x2. So here's x2's lower bound and upper bound, and x1's lower bound and upper bound. So this over there is my base case. What I can go do is, let's say x2, if, if x2 increases, it makes my MPV get worse and worse. So I'm going to say here, MPV drops as x2 increases. And let's say for x1, it works in such a way that NPV drops as x1 increases. So my worst combination would be where x1 is at this point and x2 is at this point. So this is the worst. So X2 could be a raw material cost because the raw material cost increases my NPV is going to get lower and lower. X1 could be um, could be an income, sorry, and another expense is as X1 gets goes in this direction, NPV gets worse. So if those two are both at their at their absolute worst condition, then that's really going to have a strong impact on NPV. Because these things work linearly, uh, this point over here, this is going to be my most optimistic. <coughs> Just those three scenarios. Um, you could you could also, of course, construct a scenario where some intermediate NPV at those combinations of x1 and x2. So you, you use an idea of designed experiments almost to, to to find where your uh, NPVs change. So instead of just brute forcing x1 over a, a range and x2 separately over a range, we recognize that sometimes these parameters interact. And so we, we use our knowledge of designed experiments or sampling in, in a systematic way, and we can pick and evaluate NPV at just these five discrete points. And everything else, because it's linear, should be somewhere in between, in between those. And this scales up as you go to three variables, four variables, um, so you just scale up. And Exactly, and this is a perfect candidate for fractional factorial. So if you remember back from 4C3, uh, for those of you that have taken 4C, uh, uh, this, this stands for, so you could then, once you get to four or five variables that you're investigating an uncertainty for, now instead of just doing a full factorial, you would do a fractional factorial. So all those, uh, those concepts from stats would apply here very well, and you then uh, can build a model that takes it as a function of the x1 and x2 each of these uncertain parameters. One thing to also recognize is, uh, just to come back to this concept of probability, is that certain combinations are going to be very unlikely. So one way we do this is to say the following. Recognize that my sales price, recognize the probability of my sales, so if we plot in this axis the probability, and this could be sales. These probabilities are not always normally distributed. In fact, something like sales is actually a very good candidate for a uniform distribution. So this could be three thousand dollars per kilo, and this could be four thousand. Any point between three and four thousand is equally as likely as the other. Okay. So. That's one thing to bear in mind. This is the P, P subscript K that's being referred to here. So if I'm evaluating the effect of sales, I have to realize that any, any value between that low bound and upper bound could be equally as likely. Um, and this is, this is the sort of information you would get from your marketing department. Uh, 
other costs that don't vary uh, in a uniform way would be something you could anticipate. One of your variables in your NPV that you could adjust is the time to construct your plant. So we've, we've so far said we have absolute certainty how long it's going to take to build this plant and get it up and running. That's not always the case. If we look at the time, that time to build the plant, that's lost time. That's, this is time when you're not operating the process, you're not making product, and you're not earning revenues. So definitely NPV is going to get worse as you take longer and longer to build the process. And the time to build your plant, that's not, this may have a probability that looks something like that. So it's very unlikely you're going to finish your middle schedule. Here might be the base case, and the probability of finishing your high schedule is actually quite great for most people. And then other cases could have probabilities here for your P subscript A. So every time one of them has P subscript A, uh, maybe more than those changes. So this could be something like raw materials. But the raw material costs are quite easily, um, quite likely more than those so what we do is we take, we take a number of scenarios. We say, well, let's pick the case where I've got low sales, my time to build is high, and my raw material costs are somewhere over to the left of the distribution. Okay. So I pick a scenario from each one of these three variables. That's my P subscript K. F of K is the probability with which that scenario occurs. And then I evaluate the, the, the NPV under those conditions. And I repeat that over and over. I take the different values from these different distributions, and I repeatedly evaluate the NPV. And what I can construct then is a distribution of NPV values over those, over those curves. So this is not something we're going to do in this course. It's more just to, to put it out there and, and make you aware of it. But what companies will then do is they'll then take these NPV curves, and they'll look something along the lines of this and they'll find lower and upper bounds for them. So as long as those, those values are comfortable, they'll be able to So that's the whole point we to consider. Okay, so next time we'll start on, uh, just a second here. Tomorrow I plan to start on slides 117. However, uh, this is on capital cost expression. However, if there are any concepts that have been unclear so far in this course, please email me and I can.